Over 20 years ago, Pope John Paul the Great spoke of a great war being waged around the identity of women. Tonight, we'll speak with one group which has been fighting that very war by educating women about their feminine nature and dignity. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Father Mitch Packwell, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And tonight, we have two wonderful ladies who are trying to humanize and transform our society through a new feminism, but a feminism that is rooted in service to life and Catholic teaching. So please welcome my guests tonight, Terry Polakovich and Bridget Sweeney. Bridget, welcome. <laughs> Terry. Well, welcome to both of you. It's great to have you here. And, um, you know, I usually don't have too many feminists on the, the show, <laughs> but it's a delight to have you two on because I'm a firm believer in the kind of feminism that you're promoting. Um, first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, this organization you started. It's, it's called in, Endow. What is Endow? Excellent question. Endow is an acronym that stands for Educating on the Nature and Dignity of Women. Okay. And our mission is huge. Our mission is to draw women in and help them discover the truth about their dignity and then help them understand their role in transforming and humanizing our society. And as you mentioned, we, we use the basis of John Paul II's new feminism. And the new feminism affirms and recognizes the true genius of women yeah. when our culture, I don't have to tell you, is in desperate need for an authentic feminine presence. Well, it's not just an only a desperate need. They're in a vicious attack. You know, I, I think of some of the television talk shows um, where women are paraded around in, you know, after having done terrible things. And, you know, it's just I, I find it appalling mm -hmm. the way the dignity is attacked. It's uh, uh, it, it's shame on parade. Mm, right. And pe other people, not the women, but other people are making money off of their shame and their humiliation in public. And that's just one type of show, but there are lots of other ways in which this goes on. Now, actually, Terry, you're the one who started this. Is that not correct? That's right, Father. I'm actually one of three. There are three co-founders, and I'm one of them. Okay. Um, Why did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> and how did you do it? What, what did you do? Well, uh, it started in uh, 2002. I was thinking about that today just so I had it right. I think it was around 2002. And at the time, I was working in Denver, as we're still working in Denver, uh, working for a program for the Archdiocese of Denver. It called, was called Seeds of Hope. And I, it was what we were doing was raising money for inner city kids to attend Catholic schools. Oh, nice. And one of our board members, Marilyn Coors, had been invited down to as Mexico. As in the beer Coors? Beer Coors. <laughs> Come on oh, and wow. Cool. Um, she had gone to Mexico to a conference. Marianne Glendon was one of the featured speakers. And Marianne, this, like I said, it was in 2002. So it was a few years after Marianne Glendon had come back from the Beijing Conference, United Nations Beijing Conference in 1995. And that was a, a conference which there was a real, this, this battle for feminism and for the definition of women's dignity was really going on at that conference. It was. It was the fourth, uh, United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women. And so, and it actually had followed uh, another conference on Populate uh, right. in Cairo the year before. So really all eyes were on Beijing for that conference. And Marianne Glendon was the delegate from the Holy See. And she was the one who was speaking at this Mexico conference that Marilyn went to. And Marilyn came back and she was so 
interested in what Marianne had to say and just the whole concept of new feminism and that type of thing. And so she came back and she was telling a few of us who were involved with this other organization about it. And another woman, her name was Betsy Considine and myself, were really interested in what she had to say. I mean, I always tell people we weren't any kind of feminists. I mean, we, and I really <laughs> find that's how most women are. You know, they're not necessarily like radical feminists. You know, my impression is that most of the women I know are far too busy. That's exactly you know, right. Th there's so much going on in your lives, right? That you know, you know, you're not sitting around eating bonbons all day. I mean, there's <laughs> there's a lot of stuff well, happening. Well, and really, that's, that's really very true. And actually, at that time, my children were just preteens, so I was working full time. I had two, you know, young teenage children. My husband, our, you know, our lives, everything. I was not looking to the right or the left, really. I mean. Um, actually, you were in the homily today in Mass, you talked about the kingdom of God, searching out the kingdom of God, and sometimes God comes searching for you. <laughs> you really had to come searching for me because I was searching for no one. I was really just trying to keep it all together. But sure. um, anyway, we, we, Marilyn came back. She was telling us about what had happened. We started reading. We read John Paul II's letter to women, and then we just started reading some of the other and, papal documents. And that documents. letter to women, by the way, is the one that is known as uh, Mulieris Dignitatem? No, it oh, was a letter. It was just the letter oh, to okay. women. Okay. And he wrote this actually in June of 1995 in preparation for this conference. And it was written to all the women of the world. And it's very easy to read. It's a beautiful, beautiful letter. I mean, anyone, I, I've shown it to many, many people, and it's beautiful, as John Paul II, everything he wrote. And if anybody wants to get it, they can get it on e EW10.com. Yes. Just go to our documents library and under papal documents with accept encyclicals, just type up, uh, just type in letter to women and John Paul is the author. You'll find it right away. Right, right. Um, so anyway, we were doing that and it, it, for a couple, you know, for several months, we were just starting to, uh, uh, what do you say, engross ourselves in the teachings of the church, the writings of the church, particularly on women. Again, we hadn't heard anything. We'd never heard about it. I mean, we, and I'm born and raised Catholic. Marilyn, born and raised Catholic. Betsy was a, a convert. But none of us had really heard of the teachings of John Paul II on women. And so, you know, uh, but anyway, in the course of all that, we thought to ourselves, well, we can't be the only three Catholic women who don't know this. There's got to be at least a couple more, you know. <laughs> and so uh, we decided. And don't, don't forget us guys. We didn't right, know either. No, that's so true, you know. But um, so we decided that we would approach Archbishop Chaput about starting an organization for women to teach the teachings of the church about women. And I joke now, and now I can't believe I'm actually saying it on TV, but, <laughs> um, because I've never actually said this exactly to his face. But, um, you know, I mean, we went to him. We had this, you know, great idea, that type of thing. And he's like, you know, that's very nice, Terry. I mean, you have a job. <laughs> and actually, you work right down the hall from me, you know. Please, like, go back to your job or whatever. <laughs> And so it took a little bit of co a coaxing. And because we, I mean, in fairness to him, we didn't have anything but a great idea in our minds. And it was beautiful in the sense that the timing, uh, God and the Holy Spirit and everything sent all the people to help us formulate the idea. And one of the people he sent was Fran Mayer, who is the chancellor of the Archdiocese of Denver. And Fran thought it was a great idea. And he helped us, and we presented it to the archbishop. And the archbishop gave his blessing in May of 2003, and that's when the organization started. So, and, so, and when did you join up? I joined, it'll be four years in August. I moved back to Denver to finish my undergraduate work and um, got myself a job at Endow. And I started off just, um, doing filing to, to get through my undergraduate. And as I was there, there was so much work coming in. I said, I can do that project. Oh, I can do that project. And before you know it, I was full time. Did you, wait were, a minute, wait a minute. Did you finish your undergraduate, yes. young lady? Yes, All sir. right, just checking. <laughs> uh, the old college professor in me sort of showed up. And <laughs> yes, international business. I did. Oh, good for you. Thank good for you. you. Thank you. There so, is a little bit of a story behind that. Actually, yes. once we started in Dow, and I could tell you a little bit more about even the early times of starting in Dow, but it took off right away. I mean, it was just out the gate. And we were busy, and it was me initially, and then I was got permission to hire, because we had to do our own funding. The archbishop was actually really very kind. He gave us an office, a computer, everything, but the diocese could not just for, you know, fund this new right. random right. project, basically. So we had to do all of our own funding, that type of thing. 
You but, weren't out there peddling beer or anything. <laughs> well, we were trying. <laughs> we were doing everything. That was a good idea. <laughs> um, but we were just busy. And so I did have a secretary after a period of time. And she was so busy. And we were so busy that she actually went and hired Bridget on her own. And so we had this place. We, our offices are at the Chancery. So, I mean, it truly was a few weeks before I said to my secretary, Margaret, who is she? <laughs> and why does she keep coming back here every day? I mean... <laughs> Why is she here all the time? And anyway, so now Margaret you, had hired herself an assistant. Now you sound like a scene from uh, Hogan's Heroes where <laughs> the, 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 the major says, who is this man and why is he in exactly. this office? <laughs> why does she come here every day? But yes, yes. Well, that's so. great. Well, now that you've ensconced yourself yes, fairly permanently. I'm not going, they can't get rid of me. Yeah, what, what do you do and what, what's going on with this organization? Excellent question. I'm the marketing coordinator, and I help really spread the word about this tremendous organization in Dow that's actually transforming our culture. I mean, that's what we're doing, and so I'm very grateful to be a part of it. Yeah. But I would love to share with you kind of where we're at right now, what types of programs we have. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, we have created um, study guides based on different encyclicals and documents of the church, different Catholic thinkers, saints like St. Saint Thomas Aquinas, St. Edith Stein. And what happens is we have both an adult program for women 18 to 80 and over 80 and then a youth program from middle school up to high school and these study guides are each eight chapters and they dive into these foundational truths posing the question who am I who am I where do I come from where is my value actually at mm -hmm. our society really wants to place a high priority on a woman's appearance her skill her usefulness and endow teaches what the church has taught for 2,000 years no it comes from your personhood from the fact that you are loved into existence by God. And so these study guides are done um, in small groups. About 8 to 12 women will get together in a parish or in a, a woman's home, led by an endowed trained facilitator, which is a very simple process. And they begin to dive into these truths, really pour over them, study them, assimilate the concepts, reflect on their own lives. Are they living them out? If not, how can they? And every day, Father, we get more calls and emails from women they say, I'm a better wife. I'm a better mother. I didn't know this. And it's true. Even if you have a great family and you grew up Catholic, our culture is constantly bombarding you with these messages, as you were speaking of earlier, that war that's really waged. As a matter of fact, one of the things that, another thing that strikes me about the, the influence of the culture is that, like you said, uh, they care about what you can do for us, not just what you can do in terms of your own talents, but what can you do for, yeah. for me, for them, for these other people, how you look. And what I notice is when they focus on how you look, they end up making you look ugly. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you look at all the tattoos that they keep putting on all over. You know, what an, what an ugly thing to do mm -hmm. to somebody. And it's, I think it's a desperate attempt to be unique but you have the same tattoo everybody else, maybe not the same place, but you have the same tattoos everybody else has as a false sense of uniqueness. And you're less beautiful mm. when you follow what the world is doing. You're doing another perspective. Precisely. And, and especially I want to hone in a little bit on the youth. That's, I'm the marketing coordinator, but I also oversee our youth program. And I'll go around the state and around the country and present to the middle school girls and the high school girls about just this message. And before we can even dive into Pope John Paul II's letter, which I always joke like, okay, everybody pull out your letter. Did, did you check in the mailbox? Did you get your letter? They look at me like I'm crazy. Before we dive into the truth about that letter, we have to first break down these societal lies that they see in the magazines, that they see in the lyrics of the music videos, yep. the songs, the ads in the mall. And it's tremendous. Don't forget the television shows on other networks. On other networks, precisely. And it's just, it's a constant. And I remember, in fact, one girl in particular said, you know, we were sitting there and we're reflecting on Pope John Paul II's letter. And she looks up and she says, ABC Family Network? You know what? None of those shows are good for a family. And every one of the shows is talking about something inappropriate or premarital sex or something like that. And she thought for a little bit more, she was in seventh grade. She said, you know what, it's not just me. My little brother's watching that show. So it's a moment for young girls, women, to come in, to reflect, to study. And there's no homework. Like you said, we understand life is crazy and busy. There's no homework outside or after the class. It all happens there. You read it, you study it, you reflect on it, and then you go off back into the world, back into your life, and you start to realize all the different elements that, is, is, that are hitting you, and you start to make, make changes in your life. That sounds phenomenal. Life really does because you know it's giving a, a, a kind of reflection based on depth 
not on, well, did you see what was in the last magazine? You know, and so on. No, this is, this is based on the depth of finding out the core of, mm-hmm. of a woman's identity. Precisely. Hitting them at the foundational truths is, I think, why we've been so successful. I mean, also the Holy Spirit. We're an instrument of the Holy Spirit. But really helping them understand that foundational base instead of starting from the top and saying to the girls, you shouldn't wear this skirt. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this. Help them understand your value, your dignity. Yes. And then it flows naturally. Their hearts respond to the truth they want. They want great friends. They want to choose good men to date. They want to live a life that actually brings them happiness and peace as opposed to the lies and emptiness that the world offers over and over and over again. Well, see, but that's going to be another thing that you just brought in. You know, you say uh, the way that they date with the men that they're interested in. You know, the lack of women's identity is an encouragement to the men that they date mm-hmm. and or marry to not seek their identity mm-hmm. as males either. Oh, that's such a good point. And that the, the men will respond to that lowest common denominator in a way that is still at the lowest common denominator. And neither side will help each other. Mm -hmm. This is something where it's going to have an effect on men trying to seek their dignity as well. Because that's that's what's distinctive, I think, about the kind of feminism you're talking about. It's not over against men because they're oppressing Mm -hmm. us. It's we're in this together. Complementary aspect, Mm -hmm. precisely. Yeah, Yeah. no, that sounds great. Now, you say that you've mentioned a few times that there are fundamental truths. What are some of these fundamental truths that you, you speak about? Sure. The first one, is it okay that I go? Go ahead. Okay, this is my boss. Thanks, boss. <laughs> the first one is, who am I? What, where do I get my value? What, where does my dignity come from? And constantly looking around our world, you want to put it horizontally, like my value is in what other people think of me. My value is on how well I can do on the show, EWTN Live. My value is in who I date. My value is in where my kids go to college. And it's, it's all horizontal from creature to creature to creature to creature. And inevitably, it's, you're going to fall. It, that will leave you empty. And so teaching them, my value comes from my creator, this vertical understanding of who I am and where I come from. And that's the first core and foundational truth. And then the next one we move to is love, authentic love, gift of self. You know, Gaudium et Spes says man only finds himself by making a sincere gift of himself. But everywhere you look in the world says, take care of yourself, first me, what can I do? How can you benefit me? How can you benefit me? And And just look at the commercials. You deserve a break today. You deserve this. You deserve to have this. And it's all, all the stuff that I deserve. When I talk about what I deserve, I get nervous. No. It's, true. it's true. It's true. So I would say those are the two foundational truths, their dignity, their value, where it comes from, love. And then naturally that flows to the fact that we have a mission. We are called to live this out, and we're called to tell other people about it. And, and really, I mean, from the Target checkout girl to your spouse to your neighbor, every single soul that you encounter, looking at them and upholding their dignity and choosing, deciding with your will to love them. Well, see, that's one of the things that's also commonly mentioned to be missing from the culture. I hear uh, folks my age and older frequently say, ah, nobody knows. We start to talk like old people. (laughs) Nobody knows how to be a servant anymore. Nobody, Mm -hmm. service is out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I I got this job. I dare you to to Mm -hmm. make me do something. You know, they almost see, whereas no matter what your job, you can be of service to other people and self-giving. And it doesn't matter what the job might be. That, that's what's one of the things also missing. Does, Did you have anything that you wanted to add to some of this? Well, no, actually, other than I just totally agree with that. And I think that's one of the things that John Paul II really tried to, uh, to um, teach us, and particularly through women, is that you have, uh, wherever you are, if you're in the home, if you're in the workplace, whatever, you can humanize it. You can make it a better place. Mm-hmm. Um, do it. I, my sister actually works, um, she's a, uh, not, um, well, anyway, she works in a hospital. I can't think of she is. No, what's the, the other thing that she doctor? is? A, a doctor? A doctor, not, she's not a doctor, but anyway. But they always call it the softer side of cardiology. Mm. Um, 
Undertaker? No, she's not an Undertaker. I, she would kill me. What am I thinking of? Well, then we're back to physician the Undertaker. <laughs> she's a physician okay. assistant. And anyway, she works with really, really sick kids. And, um, and it's a very uh, tense, you know, environment, that type of thing. And the parents are hanging on every single thing the doctor says. And frequently they'll bring her in because, again, they call her the softer side of cardiology. Oh, sure, sure. You know, just to humanize the situation. Yeah. But, you know, it isn't only in situations like that. It's, it's anywhere. If you work at a bank, if you work in an oil company, if you work... People are needing that. They're needing just some human interaction anymore, particularly with this, the technology and everything that we have. And that's one of the things that John Paul II brought out is that you, woman, that is your gift. Do it. You know, bring it into the world because we really, really need it. I, I knew a lady who did that uh, similar kind of job. She was a, a social worker role at a hospital when I was in graduate school. And there was a man who had walked in and he pulled a rifle on the staff, the hospital staff, wow. because he didn't understand that when they were going to put electrodes to his son to do EKGs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, not EKGs, they were going to do uh, EEGs. And uh, he, he uh, uh, was, was scared that they're going to cut the skull off. Oh. And she went in there and she just sort of diffused the whole situation, disarmed him emotionally than physically <laughs> and you know and, and again this, it was exactly what you're describing right exactly yeah, the, really really nice soft side now now and, and go ahead. you know with John Paul too that was one of the things that I mean I love about so much about what he wrote and it's not only John Paul too Pope Benedict has written about this and other people also but the idea that you can change the world if you change the heart of the women you can change the whole world and I mean that was the whole purpose of writing and trying to under, you know get to women is because women have been hurt they have been really hurt in our yeah. current culture yeah. and if you can grab their heart and teach them the truth you can you can change the whole world you know one of the things I've noticed and I'd like you to comment on this um, a lot of younger women seem much much more harsh yeah. There is a harshness that's in the, in the women's culture. And what I've suspected is this scenario. They're told, look, the guys get to fool around, and they can be misbehaving, and if they can do it, so can you. Right. And that the, the kind of misbehavior and having affairs one after another goes contrary to a woman's heart who wants a relationship. Yeah. And so they feel angry that they're not enjoying this series of relationships as much as they thought they were told they would. Their heart is aching because they really would like relationship, and they're just become generally angry. Does that make sense as a scenario? Oh, it definitely does. And I, I know when we first started in Dow, one of the things I was, you know, there were a lot of things I wasn't prepared for, most things actually, but one of the things I really wasn't prepared for is that almost every single woman that I came in contact with, and I mean, from all walks of life, everywhere, had really experienced some deep hurt from our yeah. culture. Yeah. I mean, you just really had to just scratch the surface. I yeah. mean, I, I just didn't, you know, we were developing an educational program, and so I didn't know wasn't coming at it that, that, you know, from that perspective is that you just talk about some of these things and it just opens up, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I'll it's, bet there's a lot of feminine healing of other women that goes on in terms of just listening to them and oh, talking definitely. to them. Oh, definitely. I mean, it is, and Dow is an educational program, so I always make it clear that it's not a self-help program, but it doesn't, I mean, you naturally just start talking about the teachings and you, um, I mean, someone will share their experience and another person will share their experience. And the women start every session with prayer and they end with prayer. So there's something very healing about women praying together with each other and for each other. It's well, huge. Bridge is something that you said you know, connects with this comment. You said it's not a self-help program. But from what you were saying, it sounds like it's a God-help program rather than <laughs> yeah. a self-help program. Mm -hmm. the, Precisely. I mean, these girls, some, some of them and the women, for the first time in their lives, their eyes are open and they realize, I don't have to pretend that these things make me happy when they really don't, the things of our culture. Cool. No, that's very good. And then, but then coming in contact with our Lord and His vision for women, 
Uh, you know, when it says in Genesis 1, let us make man and woman in our image and likeness. Well, let's make man in our image and likeness. Let us make them male and female. Let us make them. Um, that, that women's being able to reflect the image and likeness of God is something that God determines, not we. Mm. And that's something that would, again, make this a God help program rather than a self-help program. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Uh, it's, um, so this is having great success. It's tremendous success from the little office down mm-hmm. in the garden level at the John Paul II Center, which I, I just have to tell. In Denver. In Denver, Colorado. Yes. We're housed at the John Paul II Center for New Evangelization in the Chancery Building there at the um, heart of the Archdiocese of Denver. And I have a little funny story. When I first started working, I was on the phone a lot, calling women and inviting them to come join classes. And I called this one woman up, and I'm like, hi, this is Bridget Sweeney, and I'd love for you to da 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 And I go through my whole spiel. And then there's like a teenage boy, you can tell on the other end, and he goes... Who is this? Oh, shoot. I ruined the story. Okay, hang on. I call the boy, and he goes, hello? And then I go through my whole spiel. This is Bridget Sweeney. Da, da, da. And then he goes, do you know that the caller ID said John Paul II? <laughs> so, <laughs> he's, sorry, I ruined it. He was thinking that John Paul II was going to be on the other phone. On the other end of the phone and I said, well, young man, I think maybe John Paul II is reaching out to you. So... I'm just a secretary. <laughs> yeah, I'm just the messenger. So it was funny, actually. The mom, a week later, said, what did you say to my son? He asked this week if he could go to Mass with us. And so I think John Paul II had a little plan for him. But anyway, we're there. We're housed at the heart of the Archdiocese of Denver there. And, and, and other dioceses are doing this as well? Yes, exactly. We are in... One of Endow's policies is that before we'll go into a new diocese is we'll request permission from the bishop or archbishop. Okay. And so currently we're in 87 dioceses across the states. Great. And yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful success. We had 440 classes last year. Over 7,000 women and girls go through our program so since our inception in 2003. So it's cool. been incredibly successful. And I think why is because we're offering them the truth that the church has, has always taught. I mean, we're not inventing anything new here. We just basically give them what the church has, has always promoted. Oh, see, that's, that, that, that in itself is a, a great gift because it, it seems that a lot of the new things were touted just because they were new. This is new and this is better. And, yeah. and what was new and better was not a brand new utensil, but it was something that was a distortion. And you are bringing what's an old corrective to the distortions. Right, exactly. And that sounds like a really great ministry that you've been able to embark upon. Yes. Well, that's great. Well, look, um, why don't we take a break? We can come back in a couple of minutes. And when we come back from our break, we want to have your questions and your comments available, uh, as well as those of our studio audiences, because I'll bet this touches a lot of you out there. So please stay with us. Thank you very much. Now, we've been talking about Endow. And if you're interested in writing to them or calling, you can write to Endow. And that's on 1300 South Steel Street. And Steel is spelled S-T-E-E-L-E. 1300 South Steel Street, Denver, Colorado, 80210. 80210. Also, they have a phone line. You can call up at their office. 
Not now because it's closed, <laughs> but tomorrow you can during business hours in the Mountain Time uh, Zone. And that's at 303-715-3224. That's 303-715-3224. And their website is www.endowonline. Make that all one word, endowonline.com. Okay? So that's how they can get a hold of you. And also, we have a wonderful group of folks here today. We have uh, from different parts of the country, uh, including one group that's come all the way from the Bahamas. Now, that's, that's a nice distance to come from another country to be over here, as well as folks from Florida and other parts of the United States. And if you can come and join us, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, you can call up our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll help you with all sorts of information about scheduling for masses, tours of the network. Did y'all go on a tour yet? Oh, good. Was it good? Good. All right. Good. So, see, they liked it. And then also they'll give you uh, restaurants. We can go eat. Uh, remember, our restaurants here are very religious. We have hamburger heaven. <laughs> Apparently that's where the cattle are now. Uh, and also golden rule barbecue. Clever. And then, of course, we've got uh, you get fried green tomatoes. You know that book, Fried Green mm-hmm. Tomatoes? Well, that place is just down the street from us. Oh. Uh, the book was written right across the street from the restaurant. So, uh, well, yeah, so it's a, see, see, like now you got to go. Make sure you get some fried green tomatoes. Yeah, tomorrow I'll get you some fried green tomatoes. And uh, fried okra and greens and crowded peas and all sorts of good food. Well, you ready for some questions? We're ready. All right, let's start off with somebody from the studio. Ma'am, where are you from? My name is Lisa. I'm from Round Rock, Texas. Round Rock, Texas, right there in the Republic of Texas, one of my favorite places. <laughs> and what is your question? My question is, uh, how does the Endow program c- work in conjunction with religious education classes that the kids are normally going to during the week, and how does that work together? Excellent question. We create study guides, and it's actually the curriculum material. So, for instance, if you were interested in bringing it to your youth group, which is a great idea and has been very successful, you would call up our offices, and we would be able to send you the materials, and you could work it into your regular scheduled evening. So each of our study guides are eight chapters, and depending on your schedule, you can do a chapter a week on your regular Sunday nights during your regular scheduled youth group, It's about an hour and a half worth of content, so if you want to split that up and just do 45 minutes and then stretch it out over 16 weeks, you certainly can do that. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be something that would have its own night or or be its own youth group. You would just work it into your structure, and it would be the content of the formation piece that you would offer your students. But see, what I think this lady has is a point that's kind of an interesting one. If you've got your kids Mm -hmm. already going to catechism class on, say, Wednesday night or Monday night or whatever it might be, then why not the moms get together and do the same kind of thing? Wouldn't that be sort of what, yeah, I think that's what she was talking about there. Yeah, that's so perfect. Th- that, that would be a great thing. That way you don't have to be schlepping back and forth. Right. You know, you just stay put with the kids. If the kids misbehave, you're right there. But also you're getting something for yourself. Definitely. And women can sort of build each other up, you know, while they're you know, letting the kids get their faith It's formed. the perfect scenario, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. Ready for a phone call. We have Jean from Virginia on the line. Hello, Jean. Hello. Hi. Where are you? Oh, well, you're from Virginia. Uh, what, what is your question tonight? Well, my question is, I am so concerned about the dress of our ladies and, and men, too, in our churches these days with the low-cut dresses and the, and the short dresses and, and the slacks and, of course, like you say, the tattoos. And I, I don't believe God is proud of us dressing like that in church. And taking up offering in your uh, uh, flip flops and your uh, Bermuda shorts, I, I mean, I, I, it puzzles me, and I would just like to know what your thoughts is on that. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons we can see the tattoos is because the dresses are too short and the, 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 they're cut too low. So, what's your comment? Sure, great, great question, Jean. Thanks for calling in. 
um, I would say it goes back to helping them understand. When you see a, a girl like that or a teen dressed like that, it's just proof that she is unclear. She's looking to, from creature to creature, to define who she is and find her securities and find her value. And so I think it goes back to the heart of helping to educate her, help form her, help her to understand, no, that's not where it comes from, from having the right shape of legs or, or whatever. It comes from something much, much greater. It comes from the fact they were loved into existence by God. So we have to start by educating our teens, educating our women, helping them to go deeper, forge those convictions that then become um, life decisions for them. I'd also like to, just because this happened to me recently, it's been very, very hot in Denver. And uh, we were in mass, my husband and I, a few weeks ago, and a woman was sitting in front of him and she took off her sweater or her jacket or whatever, but she had like sleeve, you know, just like spaghetti straps and went way down here. And the whole time during mass, he was staring at her back the whole time. And I mean, I left and I was like, I mean, it well, was really, I thought I expect you to be poking him. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, I was so offended that my husband was staring at her back the whole mass, you know? And I asked him afterwards, well, what did you think of that? And, you know, quite frankly, I don't know if he didn't just say anything to me, but I think it's so much, it happens so much that men, I mean, that it's just out there. I don't know that they have a conscious thought of it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, but the whole, I, I well, disagree. I, I think we do, do have a conscious yeah, thought of it. Yeah, I guess that's really it's true. It's just not necessarily very good thoughts. Yeah, I guess so. But again, you know, maybe it's different in a restaurant or it's different in a movie or something like that. But no, all it's through not. consecration, you know, he's like, you know, and I, I, I want to be careful because I don't know that my husband was sitting there staring at her back. Do you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Right. I'm not wanting to paint a picture of him in that way. I'm just saying that it really bothered me. I mean, so I'm just saying that to other women, like, you know, somebody's, somebody's behind you, <laughs> really. Yeah, and, and here's one of the things, too. It's not just the women. And the men are coming like they're going to the yeah, beach. Yeah, they are. You know, they're wearing flip-flops and, and fairly short shorts themselves. You know, the shorts that are above their knees, which are not particularly good looking. And, you know, th there's no reason to be showing those off. If you're at the beach, you know, you want to have your swim trunks on. Okay, but not at mass. Right. And I, I think that there is a, a certain kind of spiritual, if not otherwise, pride. Well, God... I want to be comfortable. I mean, you should be glad that I'm even here. Yeah. I hope you appreciate the fact that I got out on a Sunday in the summertime. I could be at the beach or the golf course, and I hope you appreciate it. Whereas yeah, wearing nice clothes to mass, dressing up, and in, maybe you don't put a suit on every time, but dressing up is something I do when I'm at mass because I have to put on vestments. But also there's a humility about yeah. that saying it's not about how comfortable I am. Mm -hmm. It's the dignity with which I enter into worship and that I don't want to be noticed for, you know, how bony my knees are or anything else, but I want simply to be there to worship God. And that's, I think, a very yeah, important That's my message. point. I mean, the, just it was like, wow. <laughs> I just hadn't ever really looked at it until it was like so much in our face. Well, I just don't, I just don't want it to be something that's a, a burden on women. It's also on the yes. men, mm -hmm. and they're no better. They really aren't. Right. I have another question here from the studio. Ma'am, yes. where are you from? My name is Elizabeth, and I currently live in Shawnee, Kansas. Great. My question today is for the adult women and the study materials available to them. The structure that they normally take the course, what would it be like? Um, where do you find that it's normally offered? In homes, at parishes, is babysitting provided? And also, after the course is complete, does Endow have materials available for ongoing meetings or refresher courses once you're done with the initial study guide? That's a great question. Excellent question, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Um, how the structure works is that a group of women will gather, and the majority of our women do meet at their parish. It's parish-based. But in some cases where there's no space at the parish, they'll meet in the woman's home, and they come together for two hours every other week. And they'll take about a semester to get through the study. It's eight sessions. And it begins with prayer. And then there in the class, you go through the chapter and you finish in the, in, within the class. There's no homework, as I mentioned earlier. And once you go through the study guide, Endow's adult program actually has 11 study guides with 
three more study guides coming down the pike in production. So once you go through your first study guide of eight sessions, then as a group, you maybe take a couple weeks off for Christmas, let's say New Year's, and then you begin again with the next study guide. And you, once you do Letter to Women, which is the first one, you're free as a group to decide where you want to go. And some are more intellectual, and some are more meditative, and some are more um, based on philosophical um, concepts, etc. So as a group, you can decide how to go and where you'd like to go next. And so if you started now, you know, you could go for six years and and by then we'll have 11 more study guides uh, created for you. So this is going to be something that women will keep on being able to study more and more in depth and in different areas, no that's, matter what. That's right. That's what we've designed it. We, I mean, when we were talking about it, we did have the idea of a book club in mind. And that's why we wanted to give a variety of topics because oh, not all women want to study this, you know, uh, you know, a particular document or something like that. They may have an interest in another area, that type of thing. Okay. And the idea is that you could raise your children together. Just like, I mean, book clubs stay together for 25 years. Sure really, they do. You sure. know, so sure. that's the idea. All right, great, that's a good idea. We have another uh, person on the call. We have Mary on the lawn. Hello, Mary. Yes. Hi, Hello. where are you from? I'm from Ohio. Great. And, and what's your question? Well, I have one, one quick one and then a longer one. I didn't see the beginning of the program. Uh, do the ladies recommend a size, uh, how many people maybe should be in a group? That's my easy one. And then the other one is um, I'm older now and I'm a widow, and um, I just wondered, do they have anything that focuses on helping uh, older women? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so first one, what about the size of the group? Do you want eight to 12. Eight to 12 women is the ideal group, and that is enough for them to have that friendship and then for each of them to share their different faith journeys and their stories and their experiences. I would say eight to 12, focusing more on 12. And then about women who are older. Actually, we don't And have widows in particular. Uh, we don't have uh, a study guide, per se, for widows, that type of thing. One of the things that's wonderful about Endow and unique, I think, is that we have all different ages of women in our groups. So this caller may very well be the perfect person for a group of women who are somewhat younger, even, you know, a little bit older than Bridget, that type of thing. Even, even <laughs> Bridget. But, I mean, the idea being is that they, they really share a lot. A, a woman who is older can add so much to a group, I mean, but, particularly. But I think she's got an important point, and uh, it might be something to, to develop for the next one of the next booklets, because the, there are a number of issues that women need to deal with when they're uh, older and widowed, uh, dealing with financial issues that they may not have dealt with before. Maybe they did, maybe not. Uh, dealing with grieving, you know, and dealing with the kind of responsibility, which is what you're focusing on, but the, what kind of responsibility do they have now that they're widows and, and a variety of other issues. So right. that might be a good set of topics to, to pursue. We do have one study guide, and you're right, that would be more of a practical, and I think it would be mm -hmm. um, something that we could add in time. We do have a study guide that was written actually by four Religious Sisters of Mercy, and I do want to give a little plug for the Religious Sisters of Mercy because they've helped us with this program tremendously. Oh, that's great. Actually, they've been our mentors in this program, so they oversee see our work and that type of thing. But it's, the study guide is called Discover Your Dignity, and it's a two-part study guide. And what it does, it divides a woman's life into 10-year segments from the time she's born until the time she dies. And the authors were theolo a theologian, a philosopher, a medical doctor, and psychologist. a psychologist. Right. And the idea being that during they divide um, the, the, the chapters up, and they speak from each one of these voices, and the, the authors were each one of these professions and they're looking almost like what was what did God intend during this 10 year period mm -hmm. what you know during your early formative years and to the point when you die preparing to die and it's actually really a beautiful study because again they speak yeah. to it from all these different voices women sometimes um, it's interesting it, it, because it starts when you're very young and so the women will say well, it doesn't relate to me. Well, of course not. You're not 10, you know. But if you stay with it, you see the whole picture of God, what God intended. And it's beautiful. And it's like, I wish everyone would have that life. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, my name is Hector. I'm from Round Rock, Texas. Uh, great. Awesome. Good to have you here. Great. Are you kinfolk to that lady? That's my wife. Well, that's kinfolk. <laughs> yeah. My question was, um, I know it's 
for women, but as a man and a father of two boys, how do I help them um, strengthen the dignity of women uh, to teach my boys that? So, I mean, uh, what do you suggest or what do you have? Um, is there anything for us, <laughs> basically, as a man? Um, well, there actually is not a program for men, uh, per se, through from, Endow. From you, yeah, not from Through Endow. Endow. There are many programs for men, but not through Endow. Um, so I think the best thing that a man can do is to support his wife in the study. I mean, doing that, the whole marriage changes. We've had marriages... I mean, beautiful stories about marriages that, I mean, healing in marriages and better marriages and children and, and that type of thing. I mean, once a woman comes into her own dignity, if you will, the whole marriage, everything, their whole lives improve tremendously. You know, and one of the things I would suggest to that gentleman, uh, you know, right here from EW10, we have a, a television program called Crossing the Goal Line. Right. And th those guys have done some great stuff, you know, with, from crossing the goal line to uh, provide materials for men to work on. And it's a different set of issues for guys yes. than it is for women. So, you know, it's very important for us to see the, 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 the two together and, and, you know, let each one do what they do. But, again, be complimentary. Right. We have Cynthia on the line. Hello, Cynthia. Hi, Father. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. Where are you from? Good. I'm from Vestal, New York, in the Diocese of Syracuse. Great. Good to have you here. And what's your question? Good. Well, I have first I have a comment and then a little question. Last night, I held an information meeting at our parish for Endow. So I'm a brand new facilitator. And uh, I must admit, I was a little bit of a doubting Thomas, thinking that I did all this preparation, did all this baking, kind of little decorating and whatnot, and I was going to be alone. Well, there were 17 chairs around that table, and 17 women came. And it just it blew me right away. I mean, I just... I was just in awe and extremely thankful, and um, God really pointed his finger at me and, and said, I got gotcha. um, But my client, so I'm just very grateful. And these women, uh, when I explained that we're going to open up these church documents, uh, that was something that had, hadn't come across their radar before, you know, and I um, said, so we're going to find out what John Paul says about our dignity and how we can live that or how we see, our, see ourselves living that or how we can live that, try to live that. Um, but now my question is, if I have 17 women that are just chomping at the bit to do this program, that's a large group. What do you say about a group that large? Yeah, what do you say? First of all, thank you, Cynthia. Yes. yes. Great, yes. great work. Thank you. Um, uh, well, I think ideally I would ask to see if there would be another woman who'd also like to split the group and have two different groups. Yeah. If there isn't another, then I would encourage you to continue with it. The, the only problem with a group that big, and some women do it perfectly, so I want to really state that up front, that some women can manage a group like that perfectly, but there is a certain level of confidentiality that happens in, in the groups. I mean, like I said, even as we're reading the documents, things come up for women. And if you have a group that big, women certainly are going to be much less willing to share. And people aren't going to be able to really talk. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, it, and the whole thing is meant to be like a group of friends around a table. So and some women you, can... You want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. You do. You really and do. And it'll be tough in a group that large. And then it becomes easier that if you have a huge group like that and you just feel tired one day or whatever, I don't want to come. Well, nobody will know if I'm not there. You know, that type of thing. Where if you have a group to 8 to 10, they know when you're not there. I mean, they really do. You're a very vital part of the group. And another option would be, and this would be a guy's way of thinking maybe, but... Just divide up into two groups. That's what I was saying. And, and right, right at this, at the same, meet at the same place in the same time, but divide up into two groups until a leader, another leader, gets formed, and then you can start off, you know, the group on, on its own. Right. I mean, actually, we do. What's her name? Cynthia. Cynthia. We actually do have facilitators who lead more than one group. I'm one of them, actually. <laughs> but I'm not asking you to do that. But it, oh, the it, heck, you're not. Well, I'm kind of asking you to do that. But, um, it's just better, you know, but I don't want to dissuade anyone from, from taking it, you know, so that's the deal. Uh, and maybe you even 
say, you know, is there somebody who can at least help me with this? Yeah, that well, that'd be thing. great. Yeah. yeah, see, that that'd be a great thing too, because right. it's important to get other people involved to be on. Yeah, and there'll be a, in a group like that, you're going to have more than one leader. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you there's are. no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah, and I just really quick want to say, and you mentioned this when Cynthia, you were speaking. Women are hungry. I mean, Cynthia, you're not the only one that has that story. Women, if you're considering a, of being a facilitator in your home, do it. There are women in your neighborhood, in your parish, that are aching, starving, dying to hear this message. So, yep. so do it. Yep. Pretty soon we'll have notices in the grocery stores saying, "Look, this is where we're getting together." We have another question from our studio audience, sir. Where are you from? Uh, my name is Jack from uh, Winston Salem, North Carolina. Good to have you here, Jack. And I just wanted to, I think the caller from New York may have partially answered the question, but I wanted to know um, what your thoughts were on expanding this program on a national level or maybe serving as a model for other organizations like yourself. Excellent question, Jack. Thank you so much for asking it. Endow creates study materials that can be taken across the nation. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, we're in 87 dioceses within the states. We're up in Canada. We're also in New Zealand. I just heard word that we might be growing in other wonderful countries as well. We got a call from England earlier this week. So Endow creates study materials that can then be led anywhere, anywhere in the whole world. They're all in English at this point, but there is work on Spanish translations to begin with, and then maybe um, Portuguese. I know Father in the back might appreciate that. And so you can bring your study guides to any parish, to any diocese, um, anywhere in the whole world. The first step, though, out of respect for the ordinary of the diocese, is to request permission from your archbishop or your bishop. And then the parish can adopt it. I know in Detroit, Endow is the entire women's ministry for the entire archdiocese. So you Pretty can good. take it and ad adopt it, and it could be one parish. You know, I think in uh, Alaska, there's one parish that does it. So it can be as big or as small as the need the needs are there in your area. That, that sounds good. That sounds very good. I think uh, we have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? El Paso, Texas. My Great, name, good my to have you, which Maria. is not close to Round Rock. No. No, that's far. A lot. Far. See, people from some of the smaller states think that if it's, well, Texas is real close. It's, it's, it's that's border far. with Mexico. Right, with exactly. Uh -huh. So, and what's your question? My question, you partially answered it. Um, is the material involved in the program? Is that material for the people that is taking it and also for the facilitator? And also, since I'm in, from a Spanish-speaking area, would you have it available in Spanish? And also, how would be able to get it through EWTN from Denver or... Excellent, Marianne. Thank you for your uh, questions. Wonderful sets of questions. All right. Um, first, first of all, Spanish? Yes. And do you want to take that? Well, we just finished uh, uh, our translation of the Letter to Women Study Guide in Spanish. It's going through one more review and it's been through several reviews. And so that will happen within a couple months. I mean, or maybe even a month or something like that. And then it has to be typeset and that type of thing. But it's a matter of months before we have that out. And we're okay. very, very excited about it. Um, Archbishop Gomez, uh, who's now in L.A., is one of our founding board members. Oh, and so great. from day one, he's really been asking us to do that. And we, it's taken a while. It's hard, actually, to tra do translation work. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're really proud of it. So yeah. it will be available. God bless him for doing that. I know. I it's really great. appreciate that work that he's done. Yeah. Because he's, he's got such a heart for the Spanish community because of his own background. Right. So that's a tremendous thing. I can take the other two questions. There is no facilitator guide. You all, the participants and facilitators, both use this exact same study guide. We started off possibly making separate, but all the participants said, we want all the information that the facilitators have. So it's, <laughs> it's all in one book. Don't sit on your data. Share everything. Get yeah. it out there. And if you're interested in beginning an endowed class, please contact our office. You can call the number that was shown earlier, or you can jump on our website, www.endowonline.com. I'll be on the other end of the phone with Margaret McCann, who got me my job. Thanks, Margaret. We appreciate that. <laughs> And also, I want to personally invite you to come and meet us. Come out to Denver this October 15th and 16th. We're having our fifth annual women's conference, Call to be Saints, Living in the World but Not of It. So we would love for you to meet our staff, meet other endowed participants and facilitators from across the state. And if I could make a, a little push for those women who might want to go there, 
Denver is beautiful. Yeah, and it's beautiful it in is, October. October's a it's wonderful the perfect month. It really it is. is. It really is. Yeah, I, I love Denver. And it's a great conference. We have so much fun. And it is it would be if anyone's even thinking of it, I just want to push them over the edge because it gives them such a good idea. <laughs> now of in who Denver we you are. gotta be careful about pushing over edges. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And it's a pretty high mountain <laughs> up there. <laughs> Give them that little nudge, but it really would help them understand so much who we are, the program, who the speakers are, the study guides, the whole bit. It, it's really worth it. And so, so again, the, the address is 1300 Steel. South Steel. South Steel. Yes. So 1300 South Steel, and that's Denver, Colorado, Colorado. Yeah. and your zip code is? 80210. 80210. And it's in DowOnline.com. In DowOnline.com. All right. Well, thank you both very, very much. It's been a delight to have you. And it really is an, an important, important work. So I, I really commend you for doing this and for getting this going. And may the Lord bless all of you and cause his face to shine upon you, lead you in all your ways by his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, I want to thank all of you. You've been helping us to get back on schedule because we were, you know, having some financial difficulties. And your, your generosity is just incredible. So thank you for doing that. But we need to, for, to have you keep up because, again, this network isn't brought to you by anybody except you. You make it possible. So keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills. God bless them. Thank you much.